seven questions that Malachi poses to the Israelites. And uh, uh, hopefully this will be a blessing to you tonight as we go through and develop this uh, study out of the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 1 verse 2, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob? And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and you shall say, The Lord will be magnified uh, from the border of Israel. Let's bow our heads and go to the Lord in prayer. And ask the Lord to bless the reading of the scriptures tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this time that you've allowed us to assemble together this evening to worship thee in spirit and truth. And Lord, we are thankful for the blessings of today, for the health you've given us. And Father, we are thankful, dear Lord, for the, the great love that you have toward us, dear Lord, and that you demonstrated uh, your love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so Father, we thank you, dear Lord, and we can say that we love you tonight because you first loved us. And fathers, we set our thoughts and affections upon the bread of life tonight. I pray that you'd feed us spiritually. Help us to learn something tonight from thy word. And may we all be reminded tonight, dear Lord, as a child of God, you said you never leave us nor forsake us and that you love us with an agape eternal love, dear Lord, that we just simply cannot comprehend in our, in our own minds, dear Lord. But we are thankful that you do love us with that agape type of love. And Father, if there's one here this evening that does not know Thee as Lord and Savior, Heavenly Father, I pray that You convict their heart of sin and judgment to come, draw them to Yourself, and that they'd come forward tonight and be saved uh, before it's eternally too late. And Lord, we just thank You and praise You for what You've done. We thank You and praise You for what You're going to do. For it's in Christ's name we do ask and pray these things. And Amen. Notice here in verse number 2, uh, 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 the Word of God tells us here, And the Lord declares that to Israel, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet you say, and here's Israel, or the Jewish response, uh, the Jewish people's response to the statement that the Lord just made, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet you say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob. Now I'm not going to go back all through the history uh, uh, the, about uh, about Esau and Jacob. I set the tone for that last week, and so if you were not here uh, and not completely understanding what I'm talking about, just go back and watch uh, the sermon from last Wednesday night. Uh, but here the Israelites are saying, well, look at Esau. Look at our brother, how you've blessed them, and they've come out of captivity, yet we still suffer Israel, we still suffer as a nation, and there is still famine and judgment in our land, yet our brother's land is being restored. So how dare you say that you love us when you're demonstrating your love more toward Esau than you are us? That's basically what the Israelite response is here. And notice uh, what God's response is. Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Saith the Lord, is he not your brother? Is this not family? Yet I love Jacob and hated Esau. Now let's stop and uh, make a statement here. A lot of people say, well, how can God, who is a loving God, say that he hates somebody? Uh, beloved, uh, when you go through and you study Scripture, it's why it's important to have a strong concordance, to go back and look at the Hebrew and at the Greek, and the Lord is not saying here in regard to Esau that he hates him so much that he's going to rain down lightning on him or bring a, uh, bring a curse upon him per se. But basically what he's saying is, I have loved Jacob, uh, uh, but uh, I love Esau, but I have loved him less or showed him less favor than I have Jacob. And so it's like, a, it's like in the New Testament when Jesus Christ makes this uh, statement and he's talking about those that follow him. He said to those that follow him, he tells, uh, tells his followers to hate your father and your mother. Well, now that causes a lot of people confusion, when, especially when they get over to the Pauline epistles and they read the Old Testament, the Levitical law about honoring your parents and loving your parents. And then they say, well, Jesus Christ said himself right here to hate your father and your mother. He's not saying hate your father and mother in the, in the regard of disrespecting them, not reverencing them, not obeying them. He is saying love your parents less than you do me. I should be your first love. 
your first and foremost love. So uh, the word hate here literally means to be loveless. Uh, I was doing some reading uh, in regard to this text and uh, 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 come across some notes about C.H. Uh, Spurgeon. And C.H. Spurgeon was preaching out of the book of Malachi and in one of his excerpts he said a lady approached him after he preached on this very text and said, uh, I do not understand how a loving God can say that he hates Esau uh, and, and yet loves Jacob. And, and, and said, Mr. Spurgeon, what do you think about this? And Spurgeon's response was, you know, well, I, 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 don't, I don't sit there and ponder the thought about God hating Esau so much as I'm trying to figure out why God even loved Jacob. Because the Bible says, for all have sinned, and come short of the glory of God. And beloved, uh, when it gets right down to it, there are just some things that, that God has, <laughs> has elected, uh, the doctrine of election, if you will. There are some things that God has chosen uh, that He's going to do, and there's a certain way that He's going to do them. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according uh, to His purpose. And beloved, there are some things that this is just the way that they are. Just like, uh, uh, just like uh, uh, the sun coming up in the east. Why does that take place? Why did not God allow the sun to come up in the west? It comes up in the east. It always has come up in the east. And it's going to come up in the east because that is the way that God has ordained it. Just like the matter of salvation. God knew that man would rebel against Him and that man would fall and that it would take place with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Yet before this world was ever created, God foreordained it. It was already settled before this ever was in existence, before the fall of man ever was, uh, took place, before man was ever created, before this earth was ever created. God said, my son will go to the cross of Calvary and bear all of man's sin and pay for the sin debt of all humanity on the cross of Calvary before this world was ever spoken into existence. And so, beloved, uh, there are just things, if you will, that God has ordained that that's just the way that they're going to be. It's just that simple. Just like the Israelites, the Jewish people, are God's earthly chosen people. He made His covenant with Abraham, who was a Jew. And He said, I will uh, multiply thee and you'll be a great nation. And your seed, uh, your seed will be as the stars in heaven. And so, beloved, uh, there are just some things uh, that this is the way God has ordained that they're going to be. You know, uh, uh, most of the time when you uh, look at tradition, uh, the, the elder always received the blessing or the inheritance over the younger. But in this particular instance, and we'll... Uh, 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 try to read over this uh, tonight to see the setting and understand this. Uh, Jacob was the younger, but yet the elder was going to serve the younger. And so that's just the way that God has ordained it to, to, to be. And so, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet you say, wherein uh, thou hast loved us, was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob. And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom, and this is making reference to Esau, remember last week this is where the Edomites come from, is the lineage of Esau. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return uh, and build the desolate places, thus saith the Lord of hosts. They shall build, but now watch this now, the Edomites, after, after the Lord allows them to go into captivity, after He allows their land uh, to be destroyed, time and time again, the Edomites say that we will build back, we're coming back, we're going to do it again. Notice here, they shall build, but I will throw down, and they shall call them the border of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation. Now get this, forever. You remember uh, when God made His uh, uh, covenant with Abraham, what did He tell him? I will bless them that bless thee, 
and I will curse them that curse thee. When the Israelites were making their exodus uh, out of Egypt and they were wandering through the wilderness, they had to go by the land of Edom. The people of Edom would not let the people of Israel pass by. And so God had to honor His word. I will bless them that bless thee. I will curse them that curse thee. And He placed a curse upon those Edomites to every generation. So no matter what they try to do and build up, and restore, God is going to allow it to be torn down. And so there's no contradiction in the Scriptures. The Scriptures support themselves. And so, beloved, uh, the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever, and your eyes shall see, and you shall say, the Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. And so the fact of the matter is this, is when Israel looks at Edom, and it looks like they're flourishing, God's saying, don't, don't, don't get too excited because it's not going to last. And oh, by the way, it, did, it didn't last. And it doesn't last. And so, how dare you say, Israel, how dare you say, Jacob, that I don't love you when your brother tries to re rebuild time and time again and I allow, to allow them to be torn down time and time and time again, yet you say, I don't love you because I have give you and promised you a land that floweth with milk and honey. And so, beloved, the very thing that God said He would do has come to pass. Has come to pass. And so in Genesis chapter 25, again, a lot of reading here to set the tone for this. And uh, uh, a lot of, uh, especially when we're dealing with Esau and Jacob here, a lot of history involved here. But in uh, 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 in Genesis chapter 25, verses 23 through 30, the Word of God tells us that the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. Most of the time it's the opposite way. But no, in this instance, the elder is going to serve the younger. Most times the younger serves the elder. Verse 24, And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red, all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau, which is the lineage of the Edomites. You go through and you read the book of Genesis, it talks about Duke, this person, Duke that, Duke this, Duke that. That's the Edomites, that's the land of Edom, that's the lineage that's given there in the book of Genesis. Uh, take note, uh, it's very interesting, uh, the, name, the name Esau means to be hairy. Uh, evidently, this, this little baby that come out must have been like a little Bigfoot and everything. And not only did he have a head full of hair, he must have been covered head to toe in hair. That is important. That is important. We'll see why here in a minute. That's why the Bible tells us that every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God is pure truth. And there's a reason God reveals this fact to us. You'll see it here, uh, uh, here shortly. And the first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and, it, uh, uh, out and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. That's interesting. What happens when somebody's walking and you grab them by the heel? What happens? Trip. They trip. They trip. Very good. Very good observation. Notice here what takes place now. And after that came out his brother, and his hand took, uh, took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. The word Jacob means to be a deceiver or a supplanter or one who causes another to stumble. Wow. <laughs> That's why God gives us all these things from Scripture. And so notice here, uh, uh, and that's exactly what he'll cause his brother to do, by the way. I'll read that to you here uh, shortly. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man, dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah uh, loved Jacob. And Jacob sought pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. We know the story. What did he end up doing? Selling his birthright for a meal. For a meal. He ended up selling his birthright. All right, so now let's fast forward a couple of chapters. Let's get to Genesis chapter 27. Let's read verses 30 through 41. And it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing Jacob 
And Jacob was yet scarce gone out of the presence of his father. Uh, 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 Jacob's journey is getting ready to come to an end. And so he's wanting to bless his boys. And so, uh, so Jacob tells Esau, I want to eat of some of your venison. And so Esau goes out to the field, okay? All right, Rebecca finds out about this. And so she tells, uh, tells Jacob, go put on a hairy coat. One that's got a lot of fiber. One that's got a lot of hair. And I'm going to make the venison. And I want you to take this in to your father before your brother Esau comes back in so you'll receive the blessing." And so when Isaac comes back in carrying, uh, or when Jacob comes back in carrying the venison to take to his father Isaac, Isaac's pretty smart. Now his eyes are dim. He can't see very well. And he rubs his arms. And he said, your voice is that of Jacob, but your arms are that of Esau. And so his name is what? Jacob, supplanter, one who causes to stumble, a deceiver. <laughs> Not only now has he tricked him out of his birthright, he's going to get his blessing from him. Now all of this happened by divine design. This is the way God allowed it to take place. And so this is the end of that account as we pick up here in verse 30 of Genesis chapter 27. And it came to pass as soon as Isaac had made an end of blessing. Jacob, and Jacob was yet uh, scarce gone out of the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. And he also made savory meat. I swear I believe Brother Scott has beef jerky. I don't know if it was or not, but maybe this is the first account of beef jerky in scriptures. And he also made savory meat and brought it unto his father and said unto his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's venison, that thy soul may bless me. And now notice here, uh, may bless me. And Isaac, his father, said unto him, Who art thou? And he said, I am thy son, thy firstborn Esau. And Isaac trembled very exceedingly and said, Who? Where is he that hath taken venison and bought it me? And I have eaten of all before thou camest and have blessed him. Uh, uh, blessed him. Uh, and uh, yea, and he shall be blessed. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great and exceeding bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father. And he said, Thy brother came with salty and hath taken away thy blessing. And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times, deceived him, tricked him, caused him to stumble. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac, uh, uh, and Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord. You're going to serve your younger brother. I've set him in charge over you. And all his brethren have I given to him for servants, and with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? And Esau said unto his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. And Isaac his father answered and said unto him, Behold, thy dwelling shall be the fatness of the earth and the dew of heaven from above, and by the sword thou shalt, shalt thou live, and shalt serve thy brother, and it shall come to pass when thou shalt have the dominion that thou shalt break his yoke from off thy neck. Now notice this, next verse, very important. And Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing wherewith his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father at hand, then will I slay my brother Jacob. Because he had been deceived by his brother twice, he let bitterness, unforgiveness set up in his heart. And he said, I know my father's on his deathbed, and when he passes, I'm going to get my brother. I'm going to kill him. Boy, doesn't that sound familiar? Let's back up to Genesis. Cain and Abel. Cain slew his brother Abel. He was wroth with his brother. Why? Because the Lord accepted his brother's offering and God rejected his offering. 
Is this not something similar taking place here with Jacob and with Esau? Jacob, yes, he deceived his, his brother. He deceived his brother. But you know what? God said, you know what? The lineage of Christ and the Abrahamic covenant is going to go through the lineage of Jacob. You can't have both. You can't do it both ways. It has to be one or the other. And because of Esau, let a root of bitterness take up in his heart. He said, I'm going to kill my brother. Just like Cain slew Abel. He had unforgiveness in his heart. And evidently, you know, even though, and, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but think about this. We get over the Paul and, and the Pauline epistles. He, he mentions this specific account and talks about Esau. Even though he wanted to repent, he sought it with tears, but couldn't repent. And you go through and you, you go through and you read about the, uh, the, the ongoing conflict between the Israelites and the Edomites and the Edomites not listening the Israelites pass through and use the portion of their land to make their pilgrimage to the, to the promised land. Now listen, Esau had to tell somebody that. So it was passed on from generation to generation. You can't trust him. He's a deceiver. Don't you do them any favors. In other words, don't forgive them. And because of their unforgiveness, God brought a curse upon the Edomites that lasted from generation to generation to generation. And that's why it's important to study Old Testament Scripture because there's New Testament principles involved with this. And so, we see this here in Numbers chapter 20, verses 14 through 21 about the lack of the use of the land. Numbers chapter 20, verses 14 through 21, And Moses sent messengers from Kadesh to the king of Edom. Thus saith thy brother Israel, Thou knowest all the travail that hath befallen us, how our fathers went down into Egypt, and we have dwelt in Egypt a long time, and the Egyptians vexed us, and our fathers. And when we cried unto the Lord, he heard our voice, and sent an angel, and had brought us forth out of Egypt. And behold, we are in Kadesh, a city in the uttermost of, the border, of thy border. Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through thy fields or through thy vineyards, nor will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway, and we will not turn to the right hand nor to the left until we have passed thy borders. In other words, we're just going to pass through. We're not going to touch anything. We're not going to bother anything. We just need to go down the king's highway. Just this one portion is all we need, and we won't touch a thing. Notice the king of Edom's response. Notice here. Verse number 18. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me. Stay off my property. This is private property. Don't you step foot on our land. And Edom said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. Uh-oh. Sounds like we got some internal conflict here. Family affair. But what did God say? I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. This is not a blessing that they're giving Israel. It's a curse. We'll come out against the sword. We'll kill you if you step across our property line. You know what you just done? You just bought judgment upon yourself. Even though you're Israel's brother, you just bought judgment. The chastening hand of God. That's what it's about today. How can we apply this today as Christians, as children of God, in the dispensation and day and age that we live in, God chastens His children for willful disobedience and rebellion. He'll bring about chastening upon us. And he said unto him, Thou shalt not pass by me, lest I come out against thee with the sword. And the children of Israel said unto him, We will go by the highway, and if I had, uh, ha, uh, uh, and if I had my cattle drink of thy water, then will I pay for it. I will only, without doing anything else, go through on my feet. And he said, Thou shalt not go through. And Edom came out against him with much people and with a strong hand. Thus he refused to give Israel passage through his border, wherefore Israel turned away from him. So they had to take another route because Edom wouldn't let them pass through. Well, you know what? God saw that. And God brought judgment upon Edom because of that. He placed a curse upon them as we read 
from generation to generation to generation. Amos chapter 1 verse number 11 tells us, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Because he did pursue his brother with the sword, and did cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. Woo! You know, Merle Haggard used to sing a song, Getting on the fighting side of me. Well, the Edomites just got on the fighting side of God. Because they did not forgive and extend mercy to their brother Israel and not let them pass through the land. And the Lord said, you know what? I'll bring judgment to generation to generation to generation. Does everybody see this? That's why it's important to compare Scripture with Scripture. And you have to go through and look at the big, the big picture as a whole, if you will. And so, now we get over to the New Testament. And we see some commentary of the Apostle Paul out of the book of Romans. Uh, writing to the Roman Christians, Romans chapter 9, verses 5 through 18. He mentions this specific, a specific account and expounds on it to help us understand it today. Romans chapter 9, verses 5 through 18. Whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God bless, God bless forever. Amen. Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called, that is, they which are the children of the uh, 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 because they which are the children of the flesh. They are not of the children of God, because the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? In other words, is God showing favor one over the other? No, this is just the way He has chosen. Listen, we look at things, and we look at things in the present, and we look back to the past. God doesn't view things the way that we view things. God is the eternal God. God in His foreknowledge knows those that will accept Him and He knows those that will reject Him. And God will use those vessels that will accept Him and obey Him. He already knows this. Now it's up to the individual's choice to make that decision whether to accept or reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and be part of the family of God. God already knows this. And so since He knows who will accept or reject, He knows this, He's going to use people and choose people that will accept Him and acknowledge Him. And so, you know, there's this doctrine called Calvinism that centers around predestination, that since God already knows this, you don't have a choice in the matter. Everything's just going to unfold the way God wants it to unfold. No, God gives us a free will yep. to make that decision. God knows who's going to make that decision. But time has to run its course. And people make those decisions as time unfolds and goes by. Well, with God, He already knows the outcome. And so when it comes to election and how things unfold, God knows who's going to accept Him. And God knows who's going to acknowledge Him. So does this make sense to everybody? Does everybody understand this? This, this portion of Scripture is very controversial. Uh, you'll read a lot of different things about it. I'm trying to help you to understand it the best way that I possibly can and not create confusion. Does everybody understand what I'm trying to get across here tonight? Does everybody understand this? And so now, notice here, As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteous with God? God forbid for he said to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. 
For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and on whom he will he hardeneth. And so at the end of the day, you know, you read the scriptures, the contest with Pharaoh says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, but in the end, what did Pharaoh do? Pharaoh hardened his heart against God's people. But God used Pharaoh to reveal himself to his people. So does everybody understand what's taking place here? It has nothing to do with Calvinism. It has nothing to do about predestination. It's God in his foreknowledge. He knows what's going to take place. And so, now let's look at uh, the last portion of Scripture and we'll close here this evening. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17. So, he loved Jacob. Jacob's a sinner just like everybody else. Esau's a sinner. So you say, well, how come God chose Jacob instead of Esau? Well, we've already discussed that. But there's a little bit more insight about Esau we read about here in the book of Hebrews. We find out a little bit more about the man's heart. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17. Follow peace with all men, and holiness which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. A root of bitterness. A root of bitterness. You know, if we had time, we'd go back and look at Genesis. Jacob and Esau's path eventually cross again. And, and, and they embrace, and they have a tearful reunion. And that's pretty well about the end of it for the most part that we read about in the New Testament. But their paths do cross. They hug each other. They embrace each other. Esau's got tears in his eyes. Okay? Now notice what the, the text tells us now. Root of bitterness. The king of Edom wouldn't let the Israelites pass through. Where did that come from? Somebody had, had to say, don't, don't, don't mess with them people. It came up because Jacob deceived his brother twice and his brother had a root of bitterness in his heart against his brother. He, so much to the point, he said, you know what, I'm going to kill him. And so he had, so Jacob had to flee the land in fear of his brother killing him. Years go by, their paths finally cross again. Jacob's scared to death that Esau's going to kill him. So he sends everybody ahead and says, well, if he starts picking them off, I'm back here in the back. I'll be able to flee, me and my family. But I'm going to send the rest of the people on forward. And, he's, and the Bible records the order that he sent them. And finally it come down to where he and his family come forward. He sees his brother and they have a, a tearful reunion. That's important. Now watch what happens here. Looking diligent, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. That root of bitterness that was in Esau's heart troubled the Edomites for the rest of their existence. Now notice here what takes place. Verse number 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau. <laughs> profane fornicator. Vile person. You know what? Here was somebody that as much as he wanted to forgive his brother, he couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't do it. I, I, let me rephrase that. It's not that he couldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. And if you go back and study their, their account, there's some things that it gives us some indication here. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, for you know how that afterward when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He wanted to forgive. He wanted to do what's right. He even shed tears. But he just couldn't get past that unforgiveness, that bitterness. That sprung up in his heart. 
Listen, not only did it trouble him, it troubled an entire nation, <laughs> generation after generation after generation. So when the devil tells you what you do doesn't affect other people, that's a lie straight from the pits of hell. Yeah. What you do not only affects yourself, it affects others. In this case, I've showed you scripturally how it's affected a whole land, a whole group of people, an entire nation. For he would have inherited a blessing. He was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now let me tell you something. I've seen people come to altars, and I mean cry like a baby. I mean boo-hoo over their sin and the wickedness of their heart. But yet, after they get done, get up, and return back to their seat just as lost as they were when they come to the altar. Listen, just because somebody sheds tears doesn't mean they get saved. Right. Tears, tears don't signify salvation. It's repentance towards Jesus and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ that constitutes salvation. Repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, you don't have to cry one teardrop to get saved. You don't. You don't have to. Somebody tells you, well, I didn't see no tears. I don't think they got it. They don't, they've never studied Scripture. That's right. Now, I said all that, and we went through all this to get to that point tonight. And so, beloved, God is reminding the Jewish people don't look at your brother Edom. Yeah, they may be putting a five and dime up on the corner and they may be building new buildings again. It's all going to come down again. I made my covenant with your father Abraham. I have promised you a land that floweth with milk and honey. I will make of thee a great nation. My love for you has not changed. As a matter of fact, one portion of Scripture I do want to share with you that I did not give you tonight that I do want to give you in regard to that. Jeremiah 31, 3. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. When God says He loves you with an everlasting love, He loves you with an everlasting love. Mm -hmm. And so when we get out into willful sin as a child of God and we don't repent of it, we don't confess it, we don't forsake it and we continue on stubborn and hard hearted trifling in that sin God will chasten His children. And just as He chastened the Israelites and brought famine and judgment into the land to cause them to repent God will chasten us as children of God until we confess it and forsake it and get back into right fellowship with Him. Because most of the time when I hear Christians say, God doesn't care about me, God doesn't love me anymore, most of the time, the root of the problem is unconfessed sin in their life. Yeah. And they just don't want to deal with it. And so they're like the Israelites. You say you love me, then why is all this happening to me? It's because of your disobedience because of your disobedience. And so anyway, we'll stop there at verse number five tonight and we'll deal with question number two next week out of the book of Malachi. And so